<sighs> Damn, Q. Baby, you did that. But you're about to know me now, right? So I got a panel full of podcast professionals, but just a little bit um, about myself. I've been podcasting for uh, a long time. Like, I only remember when it started, maybe 2010, 2011, something like that. I'm not sure, a long time ago. But anyway, um, I've been podcasting since then, but most recently, something that I'm really excited about, though, is I've, I've actually ventured into a corporate space, right? Um, so this is something that I didn't even know that I wanted to do. So I've been doing independent podcasts like since then, and then I kind of fell into a, a transit company back in Michigan, and I actually started doing social media there, but then I started producing their podcasts. Now, corporate podcasts are a lot different than independent podcasts because, of course, those corporate sponsorships and dollars, and of course, working in transit, is government money, so like we have to do everything kind of a different way. But I'm still excited to be in this space, and what we're talking about today um, pretty much is cross-marketing and collaboration, right? So I know that's what a lot of people are here to do, uh, do a lot of networking and start collaborating with some people. But what I want to do is uh, I've got, I got my people up here getting ready to go through some of the best practices, though, right? Because you can't, let's be honest with you, we want to be friends with everybody, but we can't collaborate with everyone. It's got to make sense for what it is that you're doing. All right, uh, we're going to open it up to some questions after this, and of course everyone has their, uh, their tickets today, so you can spend that $100 on some lunch or something, you can buy me something if you want to. But, uh, so let me break down the panel really quick, I'm going to have them introduce themselves, but I am going to tell you who they are. So right to my left, all right, this is Kyrie Frazier, all right, this is uh, the CEO and producer over at Detroit is Different. Uh, next to him is the, uh, uh, what do we call it, mediapreneur, media Miles Dixon, all right, the CEO and producer over at uh, Podcasting, which is uh, where we were doing all the uh, interviews upstairs. And then on the end, I got my man, B. Ty, two-time award-winning podcaster. Right? Just one, just one, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, he didn't, he, 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 he ain't win this year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just one, one damn, all right. Hey, two-time nominee. There you go. All right. I appreciate one it. One time for real, one time in your heart. You know what I'm <laughs> so we're going to start with Kyrie. Just give the people a little bit, bit of background, you know, where you're from. Okay, so Detroit is Different is a podcast that started in 2014. Uh, that was back when a lot of people were wondering what a podcast was, period. Uh, definitely black people thought, what the hell is this? So I actually, back then, have been gathering a lot of stories from people telling like the perspectives of Detroit culture. I think, I don't know if everybody's been to Detroit, but it's a very cliquish town, but really cool town. And I wanted to show different perspectives of why I think Detroit is cool. That's where it starts in 2014. So it's a lot of intimate stories that develop it over time. And then since then, the journey has grown to so many other things in collaboration. Uh, even an organization, uh, Detroit is different as an organization, has a mission of healing community, uh, using media and events because that culture is needed to heal community. But I found that, especially with our people, specific legacy black Detroit, Detroiters that have been there have roots since the 1960s on up, we have to have tangible events. So you probably see a flyer for this, My National Hair Show. That's the event we're gonna be producing next Saturday. We also do a collard green cook-off. We do a state of black Detroit at the end of the year. Uh, we've done different events. Uh, I think next year we're gonna think that looks like we're gonna do something called the George Floyd Moment. So I'll probably be looking to reach out to you all that do a lot of community work in different places and see how we can collaborate that session throughout. As we kind of expand on that. No, for sure. And real quick, just to piggyback, the uh, collard green cook-off is amazing. That's all, that's all I wanna say. The, the, the one that won this this year won two years in a row though. Uh, Buddha is a two-time champion. Yes. They're vegan greens. He does them in a different type of way, uh, but it's another great concept of like the collaboration. It collaborates uh, the people that cook that aren't necessarily in restaurants with a lot of some big urban farming movement throughout the trade. So all of the farmers are black farmers. So it also has the growing community, and then for that growing the cooks, and obviously a lot of the people in the community and black folks are just like Colin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so Miles, let's uh, give, a, give people a little, a little bit of background, just a little bit, because I know you go way back. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to start from the podcasting situation. Okay. Um, I'll start off with WGOB, which is a hip hop Christian uh, radio station, and then COVID hit. So I was sitting at home, I'd be hearing this word podcast, podcast, podcast. So I said, you know what, damn radio, I'm going to go start doing podcasts because it's less time. You know what I mean? So we came with podcasting, and I had a solid team ever since. Uh, my squad, and then they dope as hell. Um, and we've just been pushing all the way through. The Rise Ground Morning Show is our, is our champion podcast, the flagship. And we have 1,300 episodes. So, we do. 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 Uh, podcast at black .com. For sure. And I think Miles' story is, is one of those great stories about collaboration because that's the thing. He's got an entire, well actually all of us though, right? Because both of these guys have a, an entire podcast network. And I do as well. Yeah. But we all still work together, together, because you know, collectively. And I think it works. Now this doesn't work all the time. Like it don't, it sometimes don't. a lot of egos get involved, and we'll we'll get into that later on. I just want to touch on that. So yeah, this is one of those situations. Uh, B Todd, just give the people a little bit of game. All right. So I'm, I'm born and raised in Detroit. I uh, moved around a lot though. I spent some time in Florida. I spent some time in Texas. Uh, and then when I moved back, I moved back to Inkster. Inkster is when I kind of started my rap career somewhat. And that's when I started venturing off and having my first experience with podcasting with this. It was called Blog Talk Radio. It was like, y'all remember that? Okay, okay. I want to say maybe it was from 2012, something like that. I did one and dabble, but I didn't really take it serious. It was just something to do extra outside of rapping. Uh, fast forward, I lost my motivation rapping, you know, basically just being spoiled, ego getting in the way, all that type of stuff. And then years later, I ended up teaming up with my cousin started a podcast called Uncomfortable Combos. Eventually uh, things stopped, but I wanted to keep going and as things kept going, I started my own podcast called Talks with Ty. And Talks with Ty was just basically me letting people know what was going on with me so they wouldn't make the same mistakes as I did. I made a lot of mistakes, had kids with the wrong person, everything you could think of, and I just didn't want to hear another story like mine. So, <laughs> I, uh, so I, season one, I'm basically just letting people know what, what my past was like, you know, no matter what I was doing. Season two, I brought people up to speed of where I was at right now. And then season three, I changed the game with just in, started interviewing people because thanks to my cousin, I found out at a random podcasting event that I was actually good at interviewing people. So I said, let me try that out. So now I'm here for season four. And I've been a part of the Rise of Brian Morning Show and other platforms as well. So that's how podcasting, that's how joint podcasting was actually through my cousin Tia Black. So I appreciate you, salute to you as well. And, and uh, that's, that was my story for being for podcasting. Now, real quick, too, just to mention about B Tide. So I met B Tide on the other end of the game, right? So I was actually producing another podcast, and he was a guest. And uh, shout out to B Tide because he pulled up with a bottle of bullets. So anybody knows me knows that I drink bourbon and whiskey. So that was that was quite a deal. But then even just seeing him on the other end of the mic, I understood that he can do this, though. So I'm glad that you you know you found your move right there. All right, so let's uh, let's get into it, though. Right? So we're talking about collaboration. I think all of us have done some collaboration. Though. But we want to start with this though, and uh, I, don't, I don't know who will go first. Like, we'll start with you then, since you've already talked to me, Ty. All right, so our first question today, what is the most challenging aspect of collaborating with other podcasters? So, <laughs> the most challenging thing is that a lot of people are not you. So a lot of people get on these mics and put on the side. They don't, they don't want to keep it a thousand. You know, they don't want to be genuine. They don't want to be themselves. This is like, it's like they acting as soon as that camera come on, but they're not actors, you know what I'm saying? So you have to really know who you're dealing with and know who they are and make sure y'all actually click well together when y'all get on that microphone. Because everybody don't have the same ideologies or anything. What they do is they'll say something, somebody start arguing, somebody cut somebody else off. It's, it becomes a mess when you don't know exactly who you're dealing with. So just make sure y'all y'all vet well before y'all collaborate with anybody. 
keep it with them for a minute before y'all even think about jumping on the camera. Because you gotta see how they really act and how they gonna deal with certain situations. Have those uncomfortable conversations first. That way it'll show you when you about to leave with them on camera. Or it should, it should help. For sure, um, that's what I think. I definitely, I, I agree with that too. And, and what you're talking about vetting though, right? Uh, vetting the, the uh, interviewees before they come on. I think that that is definitely something you should do. I think the one of the obstacles, I, and you know, I will judge the audience to see if we're wrong with this. I think a lot of us do vet people, but we're uncomfortable telling them that we we straight. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do it, right? Yeah. Because that's the whole point of vetting people is to see if, is this going to be a match. And sometimes we find out that it's not a match, and we still kind of go through with it. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the question too. I want to I want to throw that to all three of you guys. Like, what happens? When you bet somebody and you realize it's not a good fit, how do you tell them no? Well, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to tell, tell them no. Uh, uh, I'm involved with it. No, but seriously, I think people, I don't try to bet people out. You know what I mean? It's like I want the interview to be genuine to where even if they ask those, let them be asked on the camera and then let them see them, then let them judge them for themselves. So by the time they see they like, damn, I was acting a fool. You know what I mean? I should have said that or whatever. I just, I like for people to be who they are all the time. When you fake it, when I don't want to deal with you. I can deal with the ass though. You know what I mean? <laughs> as long as you're not no fake ass, so don't act like you're not. <laughs> don't be a fake ass though. Yeah, that's the that was the worst. <laughs> don't love. But if you can just be who you are yeah. anyway, no matter what. I, I can deal with it. I would not very seldom tell people no. For sure. Kari, what you think? All right, so <laughs> it's it's layers to collaboration. So sure. when we think about like a guest, that's a level of collaboration. And you're right, uh, Detroit is different. It's also a network, uh, a different type of network. And the reason my network is set up like that is because of this. Um, <clears throat> But then we talk about business collaborations. And that transit company, this year I did some business with that transit company as well. So I'm gonna say this just like any other relationship. Collaborations are relationships. So that's the root of it. It is a relationship. Like any friendship, the people we meet here today, it's a lot of people I feel like I should have been here two years ago when you first invited me here. And I'm looking forward to building that, but really putting that seed in the ground. So I believe that any relationship goes wrong when we're not understanding of each other's outcomes and what those goals are. So this sounds very rudimentary, but it's real. Because some people walk in and their idea is tomorrow, I wanna get a Joe Rogan drink champs deal, right? Some people walk in and they just wanna hang out with their friends, right? And being that I've been doing this since 2014, I have a lot of tools on DetroitIsDifferent.net where it's like just your podcast tools, where I'm telling people, I know you're not gonna read this now, but in about seven episodes, you're gonna wanna read this. So I try to provide the tools. And do they read those tools? Probably not. But I at least have a point of reference to refer them back from like a person starting a podcast. To a point, this is a real story. A podcaster left Miles program and came over to Detroit is different. When people come to Detroit is different, they're shocked because I don't charge my podcasters. People are like, yeah, you let these people come in this house for free, podcast for free, how does that work? My thought process is it works because the headaches of trying to charge people, especially our people, don't be a hundred here, 50 to $75 an hour, and then they feel like they can smoke what they want, drink what they want, do whatever they want, and basically become a hangout, that's just some shit that I'm not going for. Whereas I feel like if I offer you this consideration of something free up front, now I can have a better ground to deal with this relationship. The podcaster that left my house came to my podcast house and had some of the same goddamn problems. Because people sometimes run into the same issues because it was just the circle of people working on her project. And it's some heavy shit she's doing. Great things she's doing. But it's still back to like, what's the standard of how we collaborate? So I'm still learning. But I do have a lot of tools that give people where I think I'm being empathetic from looking at it from their point of view and in my point of view. And in my point of view, I want to have as many black voices on Detroit as different as possible so then I can turn around and be a, for lack of a better term, a communication channel where anybody can come to Detroit as different and say, if you want to reach this segment of the black audience, like here's one that's on Detroit as different, 
the masculine place, lesbian perspective of Detroit. You can come to Detroit is different, and then we got a person for you for that. If you want to talk to two two guys that just focus on, you know, talking shit from their perspective, we got a perspective from them. You know, where most of it is gonna be about like who has better social media news and shit. But that is a perspective, and I want to have those channels to communicate. So my bigger collaboration is to eventually take what they bring and then figure out how I can use my marketing mind and amplify that back out. But that may not necessarily align either. So, you know, it's a process in my relationship. For sure, for sure. And just kind of piggybacking on that, though, right? Just talking about collaboration and, and marketing. So just doing some cross-marketing things. Um, what's, what's kind of your, what's some best practices where you're not just looking at collaborating like to be a guest or to have someone on your podcast network, but to actually do some cross promotion. Like, what, what's some kind of best practices for that? Okay, I'm big in like the first success is start. And when you start, you're gonna have a whole lot of times, just like we had to learn to walk and we crawled and fell down and shit. You're gonna crawl and fall down in all of this as well. So be willing to crawl and fall down. And it's gonna throw you off because that first time somebody steps to you and you get five thousand dollars to do something and then you know the audio's fucked up, you're gonna be mad. <laughs> the video's fucked up, you're gonna be mad. Yes. And you're gonna be feeling like, damn, I ain't gonna never get a five stacks again. The reality is you win. You win. So I say step one is be willing to know that it's a growing process in that. And that cross-marketing also, you gotta be able to listen because that's another relationship. What are they asking for? It's the project I'm working on right now. It's called the Step Up Men's Health Challenge, right? So in my community, like I'm really Detroit hood, right? 12th Street, Linwood, Davis, Dexter. That's my neighborhood, right? right? Now. <laughs> so, like, so with it, they are trying to engage black men. They've had this contract for about two years. And I, I'd say because it got to us where it's $36,000, they probably got $200,000 to do this shit. And right now, this is the biggest problem that both presidents that are trying to be elected are having. How do you engage black men? We got 32 black men signed up in a matter of three weeks, and it's been tough as hell. So we're using Gators, Gucci loafers, Yeezys, and Jordans as the hook so that they can walk through the neighborhood with fitness trackers for cardiovascular health. Now, the reality is they said, we just want to make sure black men are healthy. No, they don't. What they really want when they came to me, they want to get pictures, audio, and video to prove that they got black men active in this ghetto-ass black community. So when you sit and I'm listening to who this funder is, I got to hear the subtext of what they're saying. But I've been doing this shit for a while, so I kind of know what the subtext is. Because it's like, as much as he's like, I think you guys will be great for this, and it'll be great. But also, I really like some of the way the style of the presentation. I know what they're saying is they want the video. Right. So I got to make sure the day that we have this walking challenge, I got to have my best camera people out there. I got to have my best photography people out there. Preferably, black men that look like they respond to the black men I pick. Get our ass black men. That's gonna definitely be full of toxic masculinity. All the time. You know what I'm saying? All the ladies laughing. Probably gonna be taking cigarette breaks between the walking challenge. That's who I'm interacting with, right? And then we gotta figure out different ways to engage them. This is where the collard green cook-off help because now I got some black men that used to be that way that are making vegan food. So it's like, hey, try these vegan sliders. Try this, try that. And then we end up with the interview at the end where it's like, I don't really like this vegan shit, but blah, 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 blah. Sure. But this has grown over time. So I've strengthened the key asset is, I always say social capital is what I'm trying to do, not money. And those relationships where I don't think other people are willing to go. And we all have social capital. You can go places I can't go, but how do you tap into that? And you really have to assess yourself to know where you can go and I can't go. And then you strengthen that social capital. Now we can collaborate and exchange cross-market, cross-brand, or really, we can just build and get some resources to the table so your family got something and my family got something. Sure, sure. I think one of, the, one of the most important things about that whole, that, whole, that whole structure is knowing what it is that you have to offer. Mm -hmm. Like knowing that, like you have to know that though, right? Yeah. And that's the same thing about just networking in general. I tell people all the time, um, this is actually something that I learned many years ago when I was uh, like uh, in my 20s. I did an internship at Black Enterprise, and I remember meeting Earl Graves, a uh, senior, of course, and he was saying that the, the most important thing about networking 
is knowing what it is that you're going to provide for those people inside the room, not just going in and see what you can take. So I think that's one of the most important things about cross marketing. And I know, Miles, you've been in marketing since the Stone Age. So, <laughs> I, so I, my, my question to you, though, in this in this cross marketing thing, really, is because you've been you've been a giant in each of those in, in the uh, the old school kind of guerrilla marketing kind of thing and the digital marketing. What would you say is is more productive? Would it be digital? Because I know you always tell me like you still got to have some, you still got to have some paper flyers. You got to. You need both. So what what's the most important though? Because I know a lot of us are, including myself, I'm digital. Like I'm but trying it, to do everything digital. But it's based on preference. Because when you come with me dealing with digital, you're dealing with somebody's competence, how they think, how they comprehend shit. And you got people right now still can't work their phones. So that's true. So when you think about it. You gotta have like when we did Pi Talk, first thing they were like, like you gonna make it all digital? Hell no. When when the CVS and the other stores, Walmart pulled a pulled the paper magazines out, I stopped it because that made that mean ain't no logistics behind it. There's no proven ground. And when you when you're working on something, you need proven ground, right? Like the thing I love about what we do at podcasts is we're able to change the, traje the trajectory on how people even think. Like the month of October, we celebrate women in business. That's all we do. Every 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 show, on, every story on the morning show, we we highlight a female. You know what I mean? Whether they do purses, popcorn, TV, podcasting. You know what I mean? Because it's important that um, the women in our in, in our in, we roll with women like it's ninety percent. Women, right? Y'all see, y'all see them. So, <laughs> so 90% women. I just feel like women is the anchor to a lot of businesses. Y'all know what y'all just do. So we made it for we made that happen, and then we able also was able to do a award show like the Oscars. There was nobody awarding podcasts, so we like we started awarding podcasts because we believe that's the thing to do. Because no one, get, like you just said, nobody knows the hell what podcasting even is or come from. You know what I mean? But I believe this. Someone said they don't believe in video podcasts. I believe podcasting is a video is a video podcast. You know what I mean? The, the key source of podcasting, of course, was audio. But shit changed every goddamn day. So we could change uh, change how people look at podcasting. Um, and I just think we just need to collaborate in proper fashion so everybody get they just do. If everybody, I, I'm, I'm with Kirby say, yes, do things for free, right? But at the same time. Um, this was based, ours was based on like straight business, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of people who want to do podcasting, but they should like trash. I mean, at least the podcasting, when you come, it don't look like trash, and you can hear what the hell you're saying. Right. No, content is up to you. Right. And no dogs barking in the background, no babies crying. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so and you, no disrespect to y'all who got some dogs barking. Right. I'm just saying, it's in the professional set, you know what I mean? We're not just in a, for those who have it in the basement, that's cool, you gotta start where you gotta start. But we believe in having professional usage. We got God casting. God casting is just basically all bad. things that's faith based or at least clean, you know what I mean? So we gotta think about what we're doing for the community. Well, I'm with him when he's about the community. It has to be out there. However, uh, we, have to, we have to have a forum to pay for that internet software, things like that. The actual studio. Yeah, space. the actual yeah. studio. Space. For sure. So, B, B Todd, I want to ask you the same thing, though, because I know you came up through the ranks. I think, really, when you first started, you were doing a lot of collaboration. I think you were just trying to get your feet wet and trying to get your voice right. Yeah. So, like, for you, how do you how do you choose, like, how do you choose who you want to collaborate with? Like, not necessarily, like, what you can do for somebody else, but, like, what works for you? Like, who do you look to? The vibe. It's all about the vibe. Mm -hmm. if, I, if, I, if I click with you fast and, and, and that, I'm going to see no real issues, I'm, I'm going to work with you For because sure. I'm going to see the issues anyway. Whatever, whatever I find, I'm going to see it. But if I click with you right off the bat, I know we're going we're gonna to collaborate you know, because you can't fake a vibe. You can't yeah. fake energy like that. That you gonna sure. feel it. You gonna know it. It's, that's like walking up to somebody like I'm real nigga. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 you real nigga gonna feel it. Yeah, I was gonna say half the time you gotta say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 you know what I'm saying? You can't fake nothing like that. Sure. That's how, that's how no doubt. Alright, so we're talking about collaborations, of course, right? And we're talking about doing some cross marketing. But this is what I'm curious, right? So once you once you make these connections, how how do you leverage these relationships 
for like advertisers and other sponsors? Like, how do you leverage those? So it depends now. So here's the thing about that. This is where when you collaborate with the right people for the right lane you're trying to go into. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, we got, I, got, I interviewed somebody that, that's in the music. So I know if they're so heavy in music, if I want more, if I want to interview more rappers, guess what? They're going to spread the word because I interviewed them. Right. So, and they and they, they shared they shared their interview with everybody else and said, oh, hey, this is dope, man. I want to go on this show, blah, blah, blah. And just kind of spread the word like that to start getting more marketing and getting put out there more. So, sure. and that helps out a lot, trust me. Like, okay. especially interviewing people within music, music and podcasting kind of go hand in hand. So, so it helps out a lot. Especially with me having a, a music background. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Miles, I'm going to go second to you on that one. Um, so what what do you say? Like, so for you, there's a lot of collaboration because there's so many shows mm -hmm. on the network. So like, how do you how do you leverage those relationships to like go to a sponsor and say, hey, I got these hundred shows over here that, and we need to like do some marketing. Like, how do you leverage that? Well, I'll be honest, this is the crazy part. Um, no disrespect to nobody, but most podcasts don't even promote. Mm -hmm. I think that's how we can see. You know what I mean, I think a lot of the majority of podcasts that we know just want to be heard. And they only if it, four people heard them, they're okay with it. Then everybody feel like they're healing somebody because their story was being told, right? But the truth, but the truth is, sometimes we be, um, don't serve ourselves no justice by just trying to reach four people because we just put it up at five, five o'clock. You know what I mean? And we come on at six. Right. I think we need to know how to promote better and market better and tell people that we're coming on next week at six o'clock instead of. In a minute at six o'clock, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. and, um, and then we call our friends, hey man, we're about to go live, we're about to go live, we're about to go live. And then your your internet bow, you know what I mean? You, you, you're going, you're looking like a transformer to stop you. You ain't doing no testing in your own home or your own office to know your internet signal is weak or strong enough to even go through the whole damn thing. So I just look at people just need to, uh, if they don't promote, I don't collaborate with people. It don't make no sense because if they don't promote, right. it, it, don't, it ain't no leverage. Yeah, I got it. Because then at that point, you're doing all the heavy lifting. Yeah, right. yeah. you know what I mean? No that's what teamwork is for. You know, shit. That, that's why the Lions ain't won shit yet. Hey, but we, hey. Um, that becomes, like I speak to social capital a lot, it, it really becomes where the alignment goes back to, I'm being empathetic, I'm looking at it from the lens of who I'm looking to collaborate with, and is this logical? So can I think like another person? No, but I can think like if I were in their shoes, what would be advantageous? So that's really the root of how I'm looking at the collaboration. So for instance, even when we did the project with, uh, with your transit company earlier this year, um, every year Detroit has a uh, business policy conference. And I intentionally said, okay, this year at the business policy conference, instead of having a chip on my shoulder where it's like, it bothers me that these white people run my city, and this is a black city, and I'm gonna sit here and basically bloviate and interview them and challenge them. I'm like, no, nah, I'm gonna walk away with some resources this time. So I intentionally, it's like the suit I wore, the chain I wore, the stance I had on that panel, everything was about, I'm gonna turn this into an opportunity. So what I said earlier set up for like some big opportunities. One of them was working with your transit company, right? And I intentionally went with another guest that uh, I've had before, but I'm like, yo, this will be a good hosting opportunity for you because you want to do more hosting. Right. So Dan Love ended up hosting, meeting someone that works with you, and from that interview, Women's History Month was coming up. Yeah. And they wanted some more, I guess, uh, like I sell content to a lot of people. So it's like, 
it's too, it was too much for them to build a studio at the time. Q's been telling them to build a studio. I can pop up and give a studio. They saw me at this policy conference. They saw the pop-up studio and they said, we have all these women that work at our company and they still think this is such a male-dominated organization. So it's like, okay, I put the leverage in for their blood stream of hosting something and then collaborate for this Women's History Month project. She actually walked that down and moved forward with the contract sooner than I did. So that was a leverage play right there. So I had Bev, it was a transit company, and it was Women's History Month. It all aligned where the leverage all balanced. Now can I take Bev tomorrow and say, hey, that went so well, let's turn around and have you connect with all of these urban growers. Not necessarily because Bev ain't necessarily in the urban garden, but do I have the social capital and community to do that? Yes, and I really do a lot of the vetting through my Detroit is Different podcast. I do ball of them. So some of my interviews may be like two hours. Yeah, right? yeah I think mine was like two and a half years. But now in that two hours, I get a better understanding of who this person is. And it helps strengthen that whole empathy of like, okay, how do they respond to things? What are they speaking to? What are they looking forward to? So as soon as something lands in my lap where it does align, and things can be strange where it just line, aligns and lands in your lap where it's like, damn, this is the one black person that did say that they design puppets. <laughs> this client said they're trying to figure out creative ways to interact with little kids. Let's reach out to the puppet guy and at least see what the puppet guy would say. And that's a real life scenario. Right? And uh, as far as like um, the alignment for trying to find a person that does align on my vision, kind of like the team here that you have for podcasting, that's the tougher collaboration, I would say. That's the tougher leverage because. It's so much going on in my mind, and Detroit is different, and the space. I look for like smaller ads for the people that work within the systems that I'm doing. For sure. Now, for, for me, real quick, I just want to pop in there because I know I've been moderating, but I actually have something to say about this. I think uh, on my end, collaboration, I'm not. I'm no longer looking for advertisers at this point. I'm kind of uh, jumping the fence from independent to corporate. So like all the relationships that I garner, I've been trying to leverage those for corporate for corporate gain, right? So knowing knowing Kari was like such a such, such a godsend because we went to the to the policy conference and they was like, you know, who can we get the CEO on to talk to? And I'm like, well, I got a guy, right? Mm -hmm. So then they like uh, they like, well, where is he, right? So they, you know, somebody actually came up to me and asked me, did I know him? Like, I already knew him though, right? So I went and got our CEO and I brought him over there and I, I let them have that conversation. But because we had that relationship, that was able to happen. So like, what you gotta, what you gotta understand too, I, I know everyone wants to, to be a podcaster, that's why we're here. But you also gotta understand that being a podcaster is the stepping stone to something else that you can be great at. Like for me, I love podcasting, but I like producing better. I like, I like, being on the other side of the camera, quite honestly. Like I started on this side because like none of my boys wanted to do it. Like they came up with the idea, but then they all strayed away. So I, I, I started wanting to be behind the camera. So I use that leverage to get other like other shows to produce, which is what I like to do. So when I say I work with B-Tide or I work with these two guys here, and I talk about their networks and I talk about B-Tide's award, one award in, in real life, but one award in his heart. You know what I'm saying when I talk about that? I'm leveraging that to let you know that I work with some great people, so now I can make you great too. So now I can produce your podcast because we have that experience. So that's that, it. Doesn't always go into advertisers, but it can also it can always lead to some money. All right, because I know everybody want to have a sponsorship. Everyone wants to have an advertiser, but how about it just breaks you off into another business opportunity? Money is money. Can, can I speak a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Okay, and then also let me be clear about some of these advertising opportunities, like. One lined up in my way that I'm actually going to refer now that y'all sit here to y'all network, but uh, the Thanks, city of man. Detroit, <laughs> <laughs> it don't align more so with Detroit is different because some of the stances that Detroit is different and I can sometimes take politically, but I don't think it would be misalignment with what you all do. But the city of Detroit uses an ad agency uh, that's pretty known around the city of Detroit to buy its ads and to be in the, like I guess, social media and podcast influence. And they're looking for like a lot of video shorts, which isn't necessarily what I do. I do long form content. 
about different programs that Detroit has this Detroit for Life program. And they bought this with a lot of different content creators that are more aligned with like TikTok videos. One of the podcasters on my network is T-Barb. She does this series called Only in Detroit. It kind of gets some reach around Detroit. So, sure. so it works and it aligns with what she does. But for me, the goal was more so sometimes I have had some things to say about the mayor and the mayor's administration and things that is due that aren't necessarily in alignment with what I do. But I, if I align with this agenda, I think the thought process is, well, you know, if we give him this contract, he maybe will shut up about that. It's like, that won't happen, and I don't necessarily do this content. And then when I looked at the way that the advertisement was so structured about how long it has to be, what has to be approved, uh, when you gotta post it, uh, all of these channels, it almost sometimes can be golden handcuffs inside what that advertisement deal can be too. So I also look at that same leverage that you speak of, of I need the autonomy for creativity as well, sure. right? Now if it's right in your lane and you're not going anywhere, that's great. But for some of the things that I do, it was way too far out of scope. So sometimes when you're chasing the larger advertisement opportunity and you don't have, I call it like, um, we don't have a, uh, they call it arm's length transaction, meaning my arm goes here and your arm goes there, and we shake and meet in the middle. If I'm doing this too much, right. it's probably gonna be more of a headache. And yeah, the cash is good, but other resources can be better. Key resource, time and autonomy. Yeah, for sure. I think that's one of the main important things too, especially when you're dealing with government entities. It's always a thing. Once you get into politics and stuff like that, and just any anybody in general, they feel like if they're giving you some money, they get to dictate your creativity. So that's something you definitely want to be aware of. Okay. Now, we, we're, all, we're all, almost out of here, so I did want to touch on this, though. Um, moving back to collaborations, right? And so we're talking about having having guests and being on other people's shows. I just want to throw this out to y'all and be tied. I'm going uh, to ask you this first. What do you think is more productive for you? In-person uh, collaboration or like via remote, like StreamYard or something like that? I love in-person more because it's like you get a feel, you got a good feel of that back and forth. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be able to bounce off of somebody, and somebody be able to bounce off of you, and y'all just mesh well together. I'm not gonna say it doesn't work. You know, virtually, it's just a different vibe. It's like going to church in person and watch the church. You know what I'm saying? It's not the same. Some of the words don't hit the same when you're not sitting there and feeling. You know what I mean? So that's the difference to me. And I, I do, I rather, I prefer the person. If you can't make it in person, you know, do what you got to do, but I prefer in person. It works out way better for me. For sure. Miles, what you say? I definitely believe in in person because while you in person, you get an energy of what, how people really feel. You know what I mean? You can tell if they're genuine or not. And it creates opportunities, like with the Poskers. When we did the Poskers, everybody started using their talents. You know what I mean? Like, Gigi and them are decorators. Okay, we're going to decorate it. Uh, Shane, you like, okay, well, I can video, we can, we can do a live with it, you know what I mean? So we just, and, and the code came through, so we, we just started using our own resources and pulled off the posse. The first one was incredible, the second one was more incredible. And we know it's gonna go further to where we open it up nationally for all podcasters, you know what I mean? And with that, we get a good feel for people. You got a podcast about policy, we need to have a magazine about policy. You know what I mean? And then we also need to have a podcast about policy. Right. You know, people about cars. We have a magazine about cars, things that's direct. And that way we get the proper sponsorship and advertisement for the things that we're doing. It ain't no in between, it ain't trying to advertise in the magazine, talk about everything else except for cars. Right. It is it's direct marketing. And direct marketing is the key to anything that you do. That's why we're, I'm not gonna lie, we have so many different types of podcasts. You know what I mean? We silly, we straight. I mean, I mean all of us straight, you know what I mean? <laughs> we, um, no, I was just saying that, yeah, um, we have an all men talk shows, and we have uh, political shows, family shows. So it's all just based off of um, the direction, and we collaborate all together, because we all be in one space at the same time. And then there are some are doctors, um, some are um, life coaches, and we could do, we still be who we are in the same room. You know I, mean? I don't change for nobody. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> I think I'll probably know that. Um, I'm, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. And, but the truth is, I mean it. You know what I mean? And I, and I don't mind giving nobody no information. We, we were talking about equipment yesterday, and I really wanted to say something. I was like, you know what? 
I can wait because I really want to talk to these people individually because we can really trade some secrets. You know, me and Big Fella were sitting at breakfast and I was letting them know, like, it's a lot of ways to do it cheaper. And then we just got to really think, no matter what we do, if we don't promote it, shit ain't going to be seen or heard. Sure. Kari, what you say, though? In person or virtual? Like everybody else, in person, it's more intimacy. I mean, how many of us have ever been on a Zoom call and go to view as soon as we ain't asked questions? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, in person. Okay. I, so, so this is my thing. Um, again, I'm in moderation form, but I, I did have a, an opinion about this. Um, I do, obviously the, the vibe, the energy in person is, is always going to be greater. But, you know, being realistic, we're, we're trying to broaden our scope. So a lot of people are trying to interview people or be on people's shows who aren't anywhere near them and they can't make that happen. So I guess my, my question now is, because I, I, I do feel like the in-person is, is better, but I think that doing it, being able to do it virtually allows you to reach uh, people that you wouldn't normally come into contact with. So with that being said, how do you overcome that, that missing vibe, I guess? I think I think that, so this is where I, I would probably differ the most because mine is so Detroit centric. Like right now. It's local anyway, so you yeah, right, uh, right now, it's a, a video I shot a couple of weeks back. Um, I interviewed um, a nephew of Elijah Muhammad. And there's so many comments where it's like, this guy's talking all the time. And I talk a lot during my podcast, usually because I'm contextualizing Detroit inside whomever I'm interviewing. I can interview Barack Obama and it will still be about his relationship to come into Detroit, how he responds to Detroit, who were the people that invited him to Detroit, and all of that because his Detroit is different. So because my podcast is so Detroit-centered, the in-person adds another dynamic. Exactly. Now, I think if I were looking at something outside of that scope, I would have to figure out ways of like kind of like onboarding and probably um, doing doing like projects I've worked on like that. It's like you really want to kind of have a chance to like meet a person where they are. Have a little bit more of a talk talk before you can record. And it becomes tougher because if you're interviewing like a celebrity, they may only have like two seconds, right? Exactly. So how do you get that? So if you can't talk to them, maybe talk to one of their assistants. Talk to somebody on their team. Get grounded a little bit beforehand so the conversation can flow a little bit better. That's what I was showing this. Well, I'm not going to lie, because we do Comic Bill on podcasting. Tony Rock wanted to do a video on him. I said, he ain't, if he ain't coming, he ain't getting on. Mm -hmm. Tony Rock came. Um, Barry Brewer and uh, Kelly Kale, they wanted to video in. If you ain't coming in and you in our city, you're not going on. Right. We had Rock Kim, he was trying to play us. When he was like, I'm, I'm straight, I'm straight, I'm straight. And then he seen everybody coming to the tape. Right, then you're like, yeah, I'll be ready in 15 minutes. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie. I said, well, we're about to go, and we weren't going nowhere. But, <laughs> but we packed up our shit and we left because you're not gonna play us because you think you're more hey, important than us. God and she is. <laughs> hey, Shady, Shady, did I tell us, let's go? <laughs> we, we left, we left the guy in the season of Dylan Craig. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so look, we, we can be up here all day talking for if this is what we do. But we do want to open up the uh, floor for any questions that you might have. Dr. Bob, I see you got, <laughs> see you got your hand up. What's going on? Yeah, so uh, the issue of uh, you know, uh, Detroit being pros and cons of being in a network, because I, I heard several of you say you, you have a network and you've been outside and inside. So can you specifically talk about, um, I, know, I know what the upside is, can you uh, talk about, I guess what, my, what I really want to know is, in your experience, is it worth it to be part of a network? Because I, 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 I can see the downside in terms of you know, once they take your RSS feed, they have control of your feed, and and then it got subject to whatever. And so, so you know, I'm a locus of control person. I, I look to, you know, what are the things that I can get my locus of control, and then I can make actionable to hit my goal targets. So, so but however, the, the issue of discoverability, and which you know, with all these changes, like people, I was just on a. Uh, 
a Zoom call and they were talking about Facebook, even people that have these huge Facebook groups, they're now Facebook has changed the algorithm again. And so they been, I was really shocked. They were grinding their teeth. And so I haven't used Facebook in three years because once they told me I had violated community standards because I put up something that was true three years ago, I kicked them to the curb. So that's my question. Uh, based on your experience, uh, give me, do, do, is it worthwhile, do you think, to join a um, uh, 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 network? Okay, uh, Dr. Bob, it seems like you're definitely familiar with the serenity prayer. I feel it. You know, <clears throat> knowing what you can not control and can't. But uh, I think it depends on your content and aligning with the right network. And having that understanding, it goes back to what Miles was saying, like even who's leading that network. Because even here, meeting a lot of people, I'm open to now saying like, okay, I may want to try this a little bit different. Just from here, I'm going to collaborate more with Miles and be at the crib. So I think it's just what network aligns best with you. Because sometimes maybe just the network that's, I guess, quote unquote, more visible may not necessarily connect to what your message is. But if you bring something to that network, they're going to be more willing to play. It's, you know, somebody in the NBA got a son on the team because right. of who that somebody is. Right. Like, mm -hmm. not and, I, <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, I would say this too. I have, TV, I, have TV, I have TV background, right? So the most important thing about TV is who comes on before you and who comes on after you, right? So if you're going to be part of a network, you just know where you're going to be placed. You feel me? So if your programming don't fit, where you're going to be placed, I would say, I would suggest no. But if it fit where you, where you feel like you get the best response from, yes. One thing good about us, soon as your show come on ours, there's so many people alerted that we live. And people really tune in, you know what I mean? So if he got 50,000, 60,000 people watching, as soon as he go on, 50, 60,000 people getting alerted, hell yeah, it's worth it. If you only got 300 people checking you every time you go on, you know what I mean? But I wouldn't, if, you, then if they're trying to lock you down though, hell no. Whatever you did is yours, you know what I mean? And you can still use your own RSS feed too. You know? Right, that's that's the thing about the party connected. You can still use your own feed for yourself. Okay, so you so but what I've been uh, uh, the people I've talked to within the network, they take your feed and it's so like now I'm with Blueberry and so they were saying, Well, if we use Podbean, you gotta go to that board. Yeah. Like when I listened to, to, to Angel talk, she was saying you go through the Alive network. So they're controlling your, your feed network. Yeah, but it depends on what software you use. Like I can have your RSS feed go directly from my system. I use Switcher Studio and Boxcast. And podcasts, you could have different RSS feeds. So, and I, and I think that's that's an important thing too, Dr. Bob. It's like when you're if you're joining the network, you do want to ask because like when you when you're working with with the podcasting, it's more of a it's more of a, a partnership than it is like being on a network. Meaning, he will be able to use your existing RSS feed and not actually take yours. So this is the question that you should be asking if you're if you're trying to get on to a network. You should be asking, am I able to keep my RSS feed because that is your intellectual property. Yeah. This is the equivalent for people who are uh, familiar with music. This is the equivalent of your masters. Yeah. Like I don't want to be out here podcasting and I got to beg somebody for my masters. Right. So like <laughs> you, you definitely write that, Bob. You want to you want to be sure on that. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know who was first. <laughs> it's bad. All right, we go. We go take yours first, and then we got you. I'm not gonna lie. Um, we charge three fifty a month, and, but we can we can distribute it directly to Facebook, YouTube, your own website, and your current RSS feed that you already have, at any given and simultaneously. I think the most important part about what we do, we, we invest into software to make sure everybody still has their own stuff and they own everything that they do. We even give some of the people, some of our clients, their their footage before they leave our studio. So it's only, it's only three fifty. So with that too, you you want to also be uh, sure, especially when we're talking about uh, podcasting, you're talking about them doing the videoing, uh, the the editing, then also the uh, engineering, oh, yeah. 
all that audio engineering, all that stuff is happening in house. So that's that's where those fees come from. So just keep it. And, and like I say, I don't charge my podcasters, but I think the value also of podcasting is back to it's a wing that has more support. So with it, you may get an engineer, but it's going to be a lot more flat. They're not going to get that help with production. If you need some help and some questions, I look at it like I tell people, this may be like the YMCA of podcasts. <laughs> you got to come in here, and you got to know how to train yourself. You got to know how to run yourself. And we'll come in sometimes review it, but when I get around to it, one, until that collaboration presents where now we can we can talk. It'll be a big onboarding process, but from there, you have free will. And also with podcasting, this is another key thing. It's a plush studio space. You can welcome many types of guests. Like I said, I'm in the hood. It's next door to where I live. So you're going to, you know, I mean, we in the hood. So depending <laughs> upon what guest is, you may not necessarily want guests to come into where we're at. So it's a different lens from community work and community development and where you go. But this is back to like that leverage in the community. And, and the communication. So if you're trying to do something more fancy and things like that, you gotta go to podcasting. If you're not doing like more community-centered work, I would say the trade is different may not be the space. And you have more autonomy about when you're gonna record too, because the studio can be blocked so much to get access to the trade is different. Whereas podcasting, you may be able to get that spot that you want because it's the business that you need. Yeah, also, you know, I, when I was doing, when I started my podcast, I was just doing it from a remote area before I joined podcasting. I brought my show to podcasting, and from there, ever since then, I've noticed a difference in how many people I've reached out to since I've been on there. And I started off joining a whole other platform. I just, just basically was launching my show coming on a different platform, and it helped a lot. So that was to also answer the question earlier about, you know, Join a network, it helps a lot. Like, you will have more eyes on you as well, and you're gonna basically meet a bunch of people that you never thought you need, have conversations that you never thought you had before. So, it's always worth it to me to join the network. You just have to see how well you work with everybody else. Communication is key, comprehension is key, and a lot of people are missing those. So, once you do that, everything should work out. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna take your question. Um, yeah, so one thing that you all touched upon was like the importance of like relationships, it's, it's such as it relates to my collaboration. So my question to you, one thing I'm challenged with is like after the guests are on my show, I send like a thank you note, but I want to kind of keep a relationship going. I'm trying to find ways to kind of keep that relationship going in case I want them to come back. So one thing I thought about is like I may send them like an email just kind of sharing some of the feedback that people sharing about the show. What are some other ways that you find would be helpful just to keep the relationship going, because I don't want it to be a one and done, especially if it's someone that I want to keep, you know, I may want to have come back on the show. One of my favorite things to do is if they're, if they're a memorable, 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 <laughs> yeah. um, I'm sorry, last night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, if they if they are very mem memorable, that's um, yeah. um, I would name I would name that day out. You know what I mean? Like I would have a, a Q Lewis day. You know what I mean? This is the day that we talk about this particular thing because he set it on fire. You know what I mean? Like make it, and then they feel attached to it as well. You know what I mean? It's all in marketing. You see what I'm saying? Like as a client. Some days you just gonna name your days of your clients and they're like, hey, this is day my day, yeah, for sure. Day. Thank you very much for your monthly payment. Um, <laughs> but, but, but seriously, that's what I do. I just make things memorable for the client and that, that helps you do things. And also, you can, you can also like invite them every month, once a month, like, hey, everybody said this year, you were the favorite, and everybody I interviewed this year, and bring them back, keep bringing them back so they can show their face more. Yeah. I, I actually, did you have something to add to that, brother? I would say uh, the first thing is I try to, and, and Q would know, so I'm get miles on, but like send out the information after you post it. Sometimes people interview a person and not even send them the show. Oh, I mean, I, I've been that person, so send them that. And then other than that, you have to, like, from depend, I don't know what your show is about and how close you get to it, but follow the person. You know, like some of their stuff, comment on some of their stuff, connect to it. And then if they do have comments, send them that. And then I'm big on if something aligns, then bring that guest back. So like if it's, and I try not to interview a person twice in a year personally, but that's me, but it has to align. 
and they will appreciate that. Or here is something that's really big. If you know another podcaster, you at this fest, offer them the opportunity to interview with one of those podcasters. I'm, I'm gonna say one more thing real quick, and I, because I have a great person named uh, Kevin Black. He was the president for Interscope Records. Whenever you meet anybody who, who you feel kind of intrigued you, get their birthday, take their birthday down, right? And call them one or two days before their birthday and let them know, hey, only, only, I know your birthday is Thursday, but I'm going to be very busy on that day. You remember someone calling you to your happy birthday, blah, 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 and let them know you're still thinking about them. Because as we get older, our memory goes shorter, right? So put in your phone as a reminder and just definitely get their birthday. Birthdays are so important to a lot of people. So if they give you their birthday, they definitely want to be acknowledged. So that was definitely one of my marketing tools I use. I call my people and they were like, damn, I, I didn't even know you knew. I'm like, yeah, you know what I mean? I remember. So that's, that's it. So yeah, we got, I guess we got to wrap it up because we're supposed to be gone. We bought the full of the uh, raffle tickets. Real quick, I did just want to uh, piggyback on that and uh, what Kari said. I think this is one of the most important things ever. I know you want to send them the notes. I know you want to send them the episode and do all that stuff. But the easiest thing to do is just like what you said, just follow them. And at some point, share their shit. Like, it's, it's nothing. Like, I'll be on IG, I see people that I've interviewed before, like, bam, I'm just gonna share it to my story. Yep. Like, dog, it goes so far. Because, like, all I'm doing is I'm sharing your experience. I ain't gonna lie, sometimes I don't even look at the whole thing. Like, I'm just like, all right, let me share it. So somebody get eyes on it, and then, and then you're thankful for that, and then also I've let you know that I value what you're doing. Yeah. So like really, even if I don't say anything about the interview that we did, like man, look what she's doing. So now other people are starting to say like, why didn't you share? They're like, who is she? And then now they're following them. So you've done your work right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I want to thank everybody for coming in yeah. today. Yeah. We're going to start again. We're going to give out some uh, social media so you guys can follow us. Uh, be tied to the people your information. Uh, you guys can follow me at Talks Week. W-I-T-T-I-T-O-D-D -D on every platform, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, everything. Right there. Uh, that, that's where you at? Okay. Um, and, and Dixon, 313 on Instagram. Miles Dixon, you will see the Poskers is my avatar because I don't take it down no more. Because the Poskers is very important. Hope y'all join us next year. Um, and, and that's it on Facebook, Miles Dixon, but it's spelled M-I-L-E-S. D I X O N because my name is really M I L D S. Don't worry about the long story. Go to at betraytisdifferent.com. Uh, and that's at betray is different on Facebook, on Instagram as well. And uh Kari Frazier, I'm gonna be walk I'm gonna go get something to eat after this. And, uh, so you know be around. Uh, you give all my information to you. For sure. And then of course you can check me out at q.lewis313 on IG and of course at www.eblockradio.com. That's my network. Um, that's it. So that's the whole gang. Thank y'all for checking us out. <laughs>